Welcome everyone to the first in a series of videos analysing the poem From Father to Son by Emmett Humphreys. The purpose of these videos is to support your analysis of the poem and to help offer any ideas that might be useful on key details. This video is specifically made to help you with your poetry non-examination assessment for the WJC English Literature Qualification. It's a really important element of the course and that's why I thought this supporting video might be useful to you. I hope it helps to supplement your work in class, but it is by no means a replacement for your own analysis, for your own ideas, for your own interpretations. I'm hoping this is useful. I'm hoping you enjoy it as well as we go through the poem. I know it can be stressful looking at a poem, particularly if it is the first time you're reading this poem, with that added knowledge that this is for a real GCSE assessment. I know that adds an extra little bit of stress, I know that adds that extra little bit of pressure, but just make sure you're having a look at it, have make sure that you're analysing it as closely as possible, and those ideas will reveal themselves as we read through. I'm hoping I can guide you through some of those ideas and make this task a little bit less stressful. The question that you're going to be asked to answer very shortly is this. To My Father by Tony Curtis and From Father to Son by Emir Humphreys are both about the poet's adult memories of their fathers. Compare the way they present these memories. That's the question that you're going to be answering. You can see the two poems that you will need to read in order to answer the question. When we look at From Father to Son, we will link that very closely to the other poem, which is To My Father by Tony Curtis. What I'd like to focus on in this lesson is for you to be able to understand the first stanza of From Father to Son by Emir Humphreys. If we are going to start analysing the first stanza of From Father to Son, it makes complete sense for us to read the poem in its entirety. Bear with me, I'll read the poem to you, listen to it very carefully, and then we will start our close analysis of the first stanza. From Father to Son. There is no limit to the number of times your father can come to life. And he is as tender as ever he was and as poor. His overcoat buttoned to the throat, his face blue from the wind that always blows in the outer darkness. He comes towards you, hesitant, unwilling to intrude, and yet driven at the point of love to this encounter. You may think that love is all that is left of him, but when he comes, he comes with all his winters and all his wounds. He stands shivering in the empty street, cold and worn like a tramp at the end of a journey, and yet a shape of unquestioning love that you, uneasy and hesitant of the cold touch of death, must embrace. Then, before you can touch him, he is gone leaving on your fingers a little more of his weariness, a little more of his love. Let's begin our analysis with the title, From Father to Son, and it conjures particular imagery that I think is very powerful and very striking. From Father to Son would normally be indicative of a closeness or an intimacy, an unbreakable bond between two people who are always going to be connected by the fact that one has created the other. Normally, that would be seen as a relationship of meaning or of warmth or of love. But as we read through the poem, we can see that perhaps some of that warmth and love has been eroded over time. On the other hand, we could suggest that from father to son suggests that perhaps something is being passed down from one generation to the next. Perhaps a gift or an inheritance or some qualities that move from father to son. Another interpretation of from father to son is perhaps looking at the, the prepositions from and to. From and to suggests a movement away and a movement towards. And that could be worth our analysis as we go through the poem, poem as we see that the father and son seem to have a very difficult relationship or at least a troubled relationship. Finally, 
we might note the fact that there are no personal pronouns at all in the title. And that perhaps makes it a more universal experience than saying from my father to me. Instead, we get from father to son. It's interesting to note at this point that the other poem, to my father, seems much more direct through the use of the word to. And the personal pronoun my, which is a possessive pronoun, suggests an ownership, suggests a much more direct relationship than perhaps the from father to son. Perhaps in this poem, it's more of a drifting away from rather than a coming together of these two people. Now that we've taken a look at the title of From Father to Son, it's important that you understand a little bit about the real relationship Eamon Humphreys had with his father. There are no marks at all for mentioning context in your essay, but it is important that you know the real relationship so that our interpretation isn't completely skewed by one or two words that we see. We know his relationship with his father was very, very difficult. We know there was distance and we know why that might have been. Emin Humphreys' father was a teacher, but he was called up to the First World War and he fought. He was injured in action. He went to war, but he was wounded. It was an injury that didn't just affect his ability to function and participate in society for the rest of his life, but it also impacted his ability to have a close relationship with his son. It's really important to note that his father's injuries were psychological as well as physical. It wasn't just his body that returned broken from war, it was also his mind. The first lines, there is no limit to the number of times your father can come to life, can be a little confusing. We know that it's not literally true that people can come back to life or be re resurrected. So if we take a look at the language used, and if we focus on the phrase, there is no limit to the number of times, there is a suggestion here that this father comes back to life numerous times. The son is frequently conjuring his father's memory. I don't think the father is literally coming to life. I think the thing that keeps returning to the son is the memory of that father. There could be a suggestion that he desires to see his father as much as possible and refuses to forget him and then constantly brings him back to life in his thoughts and in his memories. There is also a suggestion that perhaps he cannot control when his father reappears. I think a better interpretation might be that this son is almost haunted by the memories of his father, perhaps haunted by the relationship that was not as close or as tender as it perhaps could have been. The next thing I'd like to draw your attention to is Emmett Humphreys uses the word your. The word your is a second person pronoun. He's not referring here to my father, which would be a tender image, which would be a warm image. He's very much suggesting that this is your father. Perhaps this is an experience that the reader can share. It could also further show the gulf of distance between the father and son, as he doesn't refer to this person as my father. Finally, on these couple of lines, if we take a look at can come to life. This is figurative language being used. It's not literal. This is the memory of his father that keeps coming to life. The line continues with, and he is as tender as ever he was and as poor. The word tender here would normally have connotations of warmth and of love, but it seems to be used in a way that shows the disappointment that Emir Humphreys had because his father didn't show the tenderness that he believes a father should show their child. That adjective, I think, is really useful because it has a clear difference with what Emir Humphreys expected his father to be like or perhaps remembered his father to once be like 
and that realization of the reality that he didn't live up to those expectations, that he was someone that he was disappointed with. When the poet says, as ever, there's a suggestion that this son has experienced numerous disappointments with his father's remoteness. And it seems that he has accepted that he did not have real intimacy with him. It's almost like he'd become dejected. It's almost like he's become used to the fact that his father could not show the love that a father should show to their child. We then have the words and as poor. And this seems to be completely the opposite to the tender image that we had previously. That juxtaposition of cold and distant imagery of and as poor, which continues through the poem, is compared with that earlier use of the word tender. I think that is to show what Edmund Humphreys believes his father should have been like and the reality that he did not exhibit those types of qualities or those types of um, close relationships. When the poet uses the words he was, that is deliberately used in the past tense. And I think that's supposed to show perhaps more of an emphasis that the heartbreak that he is no longer alive can never be changed. He's incredibly disappointed that his father is no longer there, whilst also being disappointed that his father wasn't there when he was alive either. If you take a look at the entire first section, at this point, you're probably thinking, where are the full stops? There are seven lines of poetry on the screen at the moment. If you take a quick glance, you'll only notice that there is one full stop used at the very end of the stanza. This asks the question, why does the poet use so much enjambment? Enjambment is when we have lines of poetry that run from one line to the next, not controlled by punctuation like full stops. We also have at the end of the stanza the end stopped line, which is when a line of poetry ends with a full stop. The question is, why does the poet choose not to end each sentence or end each line with a piece of punctuation allowing us to stop and then move on to the next line? Why do we flow seamlessly from one line into the next? The enjambment in this stanza, which goes through all of the lines until that end stopped line, might signify the lack of control. It might show how this son is completely powerless to do anything about the relationship that he had with his father. First of all, he cannot change the way his father was when he was alive. And secondly, he cannot reconcile those differences now that the father is done. The son seems to be completely out of control, much like those lines are not in control with full stops at the end of them. The final line of this stanza is to this encounter. What Emir Humphreys does here is to show, despite the relationship breakdown between father and son, they do seem to be joined in a particular way. And when we look at the next stanza, we'll see how these two characters are always going to be inextricably linked and stuck in a place where they will never be able to fix their relationship. The next lines, and as poor, his overcoat buttoned to the throat, evokes specific imagery that I think is vital and you'll probably end up talking about in your piece of writing. The word overcoat suggests there is a coldness and a distance, and it gives us a really clear image of the father using imagery. The overcoat here can be seen as a symbol of a barrier between father and child. Perhaps it stops them from being able to truly feel each other's love and warmth. I think the overcoat here may signify this barrier between these two people and how they never allowed each other to get close. The fact that it is buttoned to the throat, if we take a look at buttoned, the verb, the verb button suggests that there is a protection from the cold, perhaps also being protected from the pain of not being able to fully embrace. 
If it is buttoned fully to the throat, there is also a suggestion that these two men found it difficult to communicate, particularly the father who is being described. If your overcoat is buttoned right to the throat, it impedes your ability to talk. It impedes your ability to um, be honest or to be um, warm and tender with somebody else. If your overcoat is buttoned to the throat, it also suggests that you cannot fully connect with other people. And there is that imagery of muteness here that I think um, becomes a little symbol throughout the poem. He doesn't have the voice, he doesn't have the ability to deal with the emotions or the feelings and to truly articulate himself. The next line continues the use of cold and remote imagery in his face blue. That imagery of coldness shows that every time this son sees the father in his memories, he is reminded of his father's death. It could also suggest a coldness in the memory. Perhaps it hurts the poetic voice to conjure that memory, to see his father again, because all he can see is that coldness. All he can see is the chasm of distance between him and his father, almost like his father's face is a reminder that his father was not the father he should have been. His face blew from the wind. Again, we have more imagery that seems to be suggesting of coldness and distance. Wind here could be a use of pathetic fallacy. And it could suggest a turbulence in their relationship. With wind, it is constantly blowing. It is very difficult to determine, much like perhaps the relationship that they had. Very difficult to, um, very difficult to gauge, very difficult to understand, very difficult to pin down. Perhaps this relationship was constantly changing, much like the wind. Or like anything in the wind, perhaps it is really difficult to hold on to. And perhaps this memory is taking a, taken away from the sun. Maybe the memory fades and leaves emptiness behind, much like the wind might take something away. The next part of those lines is that always blows in the outer darkness. Here we've got always blows, which is suggesting that it cannot be stopped. Perhaps this memory cannot linger. Perhaps he cannot bring his father back. Or perhaps there is always that distance and coldness whenever he remembers his father. There is a suggestion here that this memory is fleeting and therefore inadequate. He only ever gets his father back in very short snippets. He never actually gets the real thing. It also suggests, which I think is tragic, that he is completely powerless to improve the relationship because the father is gone. The outer darkness continues that use of imagery. And again, the word outer shows real distance. It's like the father and son exist in completely different places, one inside, one outside, one alive, one dead. Perhaps they are either side of that barrier that we mentioned previously. Here, that barrier is even the barrier between life and death. It looks like these two people will never be able to find each other once more. The word darkness in its tragic usage here is dark and cold imagery. And I think that darkness symbolizes the death and the loss and the pain caused by losing one's father. As we come to the end of the stanza, you'll notice on the third final line that we have usages of pronouns that perhaps we haven't seen previously in the poem. We have the third person pronoun and the second person pronoun, which I think shows that the father is moving and the son seems to be static. He comes towards you. The father is showing a desire for a relationship, but he's really struggling to form it. He comes towards you. The words comes towards shows that he is trying to bridge the distance Perhaps he does desire the closeness and the intimacy. Perhaps this connection does continue in death. The tragic part is we'll never be able to bridge the distance between life and death. He will never be able to come back and fix the relationship that was broken. And I think this moves us towards 
um, a main message that the poem seems to want to give us, which is if we are going to fix relationships, if we are going to have good relationships with those people that we love, we must do something about it when we're alive because we will never be able to fix it once we are gone. The word hesitant here is inside parenthetical commas. You'll notice that the line, he comes towards you, is interjected with the word hesitant. And that word hesitant shows a trepidation, almost like this father is worried. Perhaps he feels guilt because of the pain that's been caused by his death. Perhaps he doesn't want to continue to haunt his son. He doesn't want to continue hurting him. It's almost like he desperately wants to fix the relationship, but is really worried that he will continue to make it worse. I think there's a suggestion that the father wanted to communicate with the son. He just did not have the ability to do so. Linking to the adjective hesitant, we have the adjective unwilling to describe the father. I think here that is supposed to show that he does not want his presence in the memory to cause pain. He doesn't want to come back and to revisit his son through memories because he knows that that is painful for the son. He knows it's a reminder of their poor relationship. And yet there is also an understanding that memories are intermingled with happiness and sadness. To get his father back might cause happiness, but every time he sees his father through memories, it actually causes sadness. What we have there is a clear mixture of emotions that memories can evoke. The word intrude also shows that this father does not feel like he belongs. He doesn't belong in a world with his father. He doesn't belong in the world of the living but also perhaps he did not feel like he belonged after he returned from war. We then have the verb driven, a particularly powerful word driven. And that verb shows that he cannot stop himself from coming to see his son. It's almost like he's compelled to return, even though he knows that it could be quite upsetting. Perhaps that shows that this father was desperate for a relationship, desperate for communication, desperate for um, some sort of connection with his father, and yet could not overcome the difficulties, difficulties that he had. I think the word yet is particularly important there, showing that even though he acted one way, perhaps what he wanted was slightly different. We then have the phrase at the point of love. And here we've got a clear juxtaposition because the memory, even though it is one of sadness and a reminder of loss, it is also one of love. The love that the father showed the son was not an adequate type of love. He was unable to show it. He was unable to articulate it. He was unable to make the son feel it. And yet there is still a love that the father is desperate to show his son. The final line of this stanza is to this encounter. The word encounter is a meeting. It is a connection. It is a meeting here of father and son. I think there's a suggestion that they both desire a connection, but he doesn't want to cause pain, but he cannot stay away either. 
As we look at the parts of this stanza, you'll also notice that those parenthetical commas around the word hesitant can be labelled as a caesura. And I've left this to last because I think it really shows the kind of feelings of the father who returns. It shows how unsure, it shows how concerned he is. He doesn't want to continue to cause pain with his son. He wishes he could improve that relationship. He wishes he could articulate himself, but he doesn't feel like he has the ability to do so. The final part is the end stopped line. I think that adds a poignancy. I think that adds a tragic nature that this father and son will never be able to bridge the divide. And this father and son, they see each other once again, but they cannot really get the relationship that they want from each other. It seems like it's always going to be a relationship of disappointment. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and to come along with me with a uh, really quick analysis of the first stanza. I'm hoping it's been useful. I'm hoping some of the ideas you'll be able to develop on um, when it comes to your lessons and when it comes to that final assessment. I'll make another video on the second stanza and hopefully that will allow you to continue to access this poem and hopefully lead to fantastic results for you. Thank you very much for watching.